Hi guys, welcome back to Rock Sydney International Online Church. If this is your first time joining us, let me say welcome. My name is Yoshi, I am one of the pastors, and today I'll bring you the word. So if you have your Bible, open up with me to Daniel chapter 3, okay? We're in a, a third series of a sermon um, that we called, that we titled Against All Odds, okay? And today is the third part, so if you missed the first part and second part, I do want to encourage you to go and check it out at our YouTube channel or our website, and you can find all the video, audio, and manuscript there. So if you have a Bible, open up with me to Daniel chapter 3. Um, the sermon will be based on the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read you verse 14 to verse 25. And just like what we do every single week, I do want to invite you to stand on your feet as we honor the Word of God and as we read the Word of God together. So right, let's read together in count of three. One, two, three. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the son of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against the drug Meshach and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the four is like a son of the gods. What a beautiful story. Okay, let's pray and we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story, Lord. And for many of us, maybe we grew up with this story, Lord. We listened to this story so many times, but I pray that you help us to understand this story in such a way, Lord, that we be able to see what is our role as sojourners and exile in this world. How can we live a spiritual, bicultural life in this city, Lord? Help us because we want to be faithful to your words and we want to be blessing to us here at the same time. And we know it's difficult, but we know, Holy Spirit, that you are able to do that within us and for us, Lord. As you are enabled to drag Meshach and Abednego to do the same, we pray that as we read the word of God, that we are empowered to also be able to be faithful to your words and be a blessing to us here. And help us, Lord, because my words are limited, but your word is not contained by time and space, that you can transform us as we listen to your word right now. So do that, Holy Spirit. Transform our heart, transform our mind. And we ask this in the name of beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. Now, how many of you love the documentary, The Last Dance? Okay. I admit I'm a late camera on this um, TV show, but um, I just started watching it recently. But let me tell you, I'm not even a fan of basketball, but I love The Last Dance, right? Watching The Last Dance made me wish that I was Michael Jordan. I mean, anyone feel that same way like me? Like when you watch it, like MJ was so great. I mean, at least if you don't, you know, feel like want to be an MJ, at least it makes you want to sing, right? It makes you want to sing this song like, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about her every night and day. 
spread my wing and fly away, yeah. Like, you know, you want to jump and just dunk, you know. It's just amazing, like, wow. And one of the things that really struck me from the show is when one of MJ brothers say something along this line, all right. Uh, he says this, if you want to see Michael at his best, tell him that he cannot do it and he will prove you wrong. And I'm like, wow, man. And that's how MJ grew himself for every single finals. Okay, he always have this competition with himself, you know, with other people and that tell you, you can't do it, you suck, but he, he proved them wrong. Okay. Jordan was driven by desire for greatness. He was the epitome of humankind. Why? Because there's a desire for greatness inside of us. There's a deep desire for us to be somebody and make our mark in the world. Like we're not, we might not be Michael Jordan, right? But we want people to recognize us as somebody. We want to leave our mark in the world. We want to be great, okay? Why am I telling you this story? Because our passage today is about someone who desire everlasting greatness for himself. Okay, and today we're in part three of a series on the book of Daniel against all odds. But let's review part one and part two first. So previously, in Against All Odds, Daniel and his friends were taken into exile into Babylon. And this created tension straight away. Because the value of the city of Babylon is very different from the value that they have in Jerusalem. The culture of Babylon are different from the culture that they have from the Bible. See, like one of the main examples is Babylon believed in multiple gods, while the Israelites, they believe in one true living God. So the temptation for them is whether they withdraw from Babylon or they become like Babylon. They assimilate with the Babylon. But then Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to make it short, we call them, call them SMA. Daniel and SMA, they decided to choose the third way. And what is that way? The gospel way, the spiritual, bicultural way, where they are, remain faithful to God, and yet they are become a blessing to the city at the same time. So, but, and so far so good. In Daniel chapter 1, it works out well. In Daniel chapter 2, they're promoted to the highest position in Babylon. So far so good. But then, good time did not last forever. Eventually, these two different values begin to add odd at one another, and they must choose one side. And that's what happened in this chapter. Here's the question that we want to struggle with today, all right? What do you do when the authority works against you? What do you do when you are persecuted for doing, well, for doing what is right? Where do you draw the line? Okay? And ultimately, it leads to this question. When is it right for us to disobey authority? And let me give you the general answer. Here's my general answer. It is right to disobey, disobey authority when the authority commands what God forbids or forbids what God commands. Okay, let me repeat that. It is right to disobey authority when the authority commands what God forbids, or forbids what God commands. So there are two sides of it. And we will see both, say, both cases play out in the book of Daniel. One in chapter 3, today's chapter, and the other in chapter 6, okay? And today we come into the story of the fiery burning furnace, right? This is one of my favorite stories in Sunday school. I mean, this is fascinating. This is Breathtaking. I mean, if you know the story, you know what's going to happen, right? This is awesome. Okay, and, and then the story itself is very simple. It captivates our imagination. That the point is very simple. The point is this, that God is working for his people against all odds. But then this story also is very relevant to help us to live a spiritually bicultural life. What does it mean for us to be a sojourner and exile? Okay, this story will tell us. Because we might not face the death and life situation like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but every day we are tempted, every day we are tempted to serve other gods besides the God of the Bible. See, the gods of our culture tell us every day, bow down to me, worship me, and I will give you what you want. But then there's a conflict inside of us because we know that's not our God. Our God is Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And before we start, let me make something clear, because you will ask this question. The question that we'll, a lot of people ask when they read Daniel chapter 3 is this, where is Daniel? And let me tell you the, the answer, 
I do not know. <laughs> like, I really do, do not know where Daniel is. Yeah. Um, the order of the book of Daniel never tell us where Daniel was in Daniel chapter 3. Maybe he was on holiday in Hawaii, or maybe he was taking a business trip somewhere else. We do not know, okay? but he's not part of this story. But today's story focuses on Daniel's friend, SMA, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? Now, I divided this story into four different chapters so, to make it easier for us. The temptation, the accusation, the stand, and the fiery furnace. Let's look at the first one, the temptation. Now, if you remember what happened in Daniel chapter 2, remember what happened? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? An image, a big statue, okay? A monster statue made of different materials. And those different materials represented different kingdoms that will come after Babylon. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the gold, the hat. You are the gold, okay? It's so like, mm, I'm the gold. Awesome, you're the greatest out of all. Awesome. But then in Daniel chapter 3, something happened, okay? Something weird happened. Let's look at it in verse 1 and 2. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set up on a plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justice, the magistrate, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So don't miss it. Okay, this is Nebuchadnezzar's attempt to achieve everlasting greatness. Because remember, in the, the dream that he had, the, just the hat is the gold. And Nebuchadnezzar, you are that gold. You are that hat. But then he thought to himself, why just the hat? Why just, why not make the whole statue out of gold? And that is what, exactly what he did. So he created this humongous statue, humongous image made out of gold. Okay? This is, with another word, this is his attempt to think about, would it be nice if my kingdom lasts forever? I mean, would it be nice if Babylon will reign forever? He wants to be the sovereign king over the everlasting kingdom. And that's why the, stat the statue is monstrous, right? It is about 30 meters high and 3 meters wide. Okay, that's huge. Okay, we're not sure what sort of image it is. Uh, some guess it's probably an image of Nebuchadnezzar, probably. If that's true, then he must be extremely narcissistic, right? I mean, how whew, that statue of you that big, boom. Or some say, no, this is one of the gods of Babylon. We do not know which one is true, but we know what it stands for. The statue stands for everything that Babylon is. Their culture, their gods, their belief, their value. That's what the statue stands for. So now Nebuchadnezzar gathered all the leaders from different province and nation to come to Babylon. And this is what happened, okay? And this is very strategic. So here's what happened. So whenever they hear music start playing, what they have to do is everyone in public space have to stop whatever they do. They have to bow down and worship the statue. I mean, this is brilliant. Do you know why this is brilliant? Because remember, Babylon believed in multiple gods. And Babylon has just conquered different countries who have different gods. So what Nebuchadnezzar tried to do is Nebuchadnezzar tried to unite all those kingdoms and nation by giving them one new God, okay? And Nebuchadnezzar is not saying this. Nebuchadnezzar is not saying, man, you, you shall neglect all your gods and worship this one God. That's not what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. What they try to do, what Babylon tried to do is this, okay, it's okay, you can worship your other gods, but also worship these gods. This new God, this statue will be the God that will unite all nations under Babylon. But here's the problem though. Not only that they commanded to worship this statue as their new God, but there will be consequences if they refuse to worship the statue. Now, this created a problem for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's triple pressure for them. First, the authority demands it. Second, everybody else doing it. And third, there's consequences for not doing it. I mean, if it's just the one and two, I mean, it's fine. They can still live in the tension. They can still, you know, do it and uh, not do it. I mean, they can still live in that tension. But now, it's not possible because if they refuse to do it, there'll be consequences. There'll be consequences. Now, the two value collides. But at the same time, they know they cannot do it. Why? Because it goes against what the Bible commands. 
If you remember the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments say, you shall have no other gods before me, that's one. And the second commandment say, you shall not make a calf image and bow down before it, for our God is a jealous God. So they know it's not an option. So now the two value collides, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have to choose one over the other. So if they choose the value, the gods of the culture, they'll prosper. But if they choose the God of the Bible, the value of their Bible, the value of their scripture, they will face the consequences. Now, let's apply it to our situation today. Because here's the question that all of us must answer. What do you do when you are pressured to do something that God forbids? Because that's the temptation that we face every day. See, our culture is tempting us to serve multiple gods every day. See, our, our culture is not telling us to stop being Christian. Oh, no, 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 no. Our culture, that's okay. You, you're Christian, that's fine. See, be you in private space. Be Christian at your home. But when you're in public space, then you got to embrace uh, the gods of our culture. you got to embrace our value. Don't try to convert other people to your belief. That's intolerant. Don't do that. In public, be Babylon. In private, feel free to be Jews. Okay, that's what our culture are telling us every day. Now, let me give you an example. Maybe it's still you know, not very concrete to you. Okay, let me give you two examples. Okay? One is from business world. Here's what happened. Our culture is telling us when we do business, if you do business, basically this. The main important thing, the main thing is for you to make as much profit as possible. Right? So do whatever it takes in order for you to make as, money, as much money as possible. Be ruthless in your business practice. Don't worry about other businesses, other people, as long as you make profit. See, and when you look at other people's, other people's business, their business are barely legal. They keep bribing people in authority to have their way. They keep cheating here and there. They make shortcuts here and there. And they, they prosper because of that. But then, you're Christian. Okay? And, but you saw these are your competitors. This is what, what they do. So the way everyone, everybody else do their business now put tremendous pressure on you on how you do your business. Because you think, if I don't adopt what they're doing, how can I compete with them? I mean, if I continue to follow my value and they keep taking the shortcut and they keep bribing and their business barely legal, how can I compete with them? So then you started to think, maybe I need to be as ruthless as them, as barely legal as their business in order to be able to compete with them. Here's what happened. If you start to think that way, you have bowed down to the gods of our culture. So basically, you say, no, 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 I'm a Christian. Yes, you're a Christian. But you forgot that Christian value, honesty, and generosity. So you might be Christian at home, but when you, the way you run your business, you have bowed down to the gods of our culture. You even sugarcoat it by saying, you know what? All the profits that I make, okay, most of them, I'm going to give it to the church to buy a new building for our church. Isn't that great? But that's not true. If you do that, you have bowed down to the gods of our culture. Let me give you another example, okay? I think that's this one more general. What about LGBTQ? Okay, this is one of the things that um, our culture uh, cont contradict the value of the Bible. The culture is telling us that LGBTQ is a matter of human right. Everyone is entitled to pursue their desire, right? Who are you to say that I can't pursue my innate desire? I was born like this. This is my right. I can choose whatever I want. This is my body. Who are you to tell me what not to do? I mean, feel free to disagree with me. Feel free, but let me do what I want in public. Don't contradict me. Okay, that's what our culture is saying. So what do you do? Okay, let me make it more personal. Let's say there's a homosexual couple who comes up to me and asks me to bless their wedding. Okay, well, here's the problem. They have the culture on their side. Today, um, same-sex marriage is legal. And so they have the government on their side, they have the culture on their side, and they come to me, bless our wedding, and here's, I, when I, here's the, the problem though. I know what the Bible say. See, the Bible clearly explained to us that marriage is reserved between male and female. That's a union between male and female. That's what marriage is. So now, what should I do? 
what is the church position toward LGBTQ? Should I celebrate their wedding? Okay, because here's what happened. If I accept that and I celebrate their wedding and I bless them, here's what's going to happen. The culture will celebrate me. They will call me hero. They will call me, wow, what a progressive pastor. Amazing. Okay, they will think highly of me. And I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of pastors, why a lot of church today uh, accepted LGBTQ. And yet, if we want to be faithful to the Word of God and we know that homosexual activity, homosexual marriage is sin in the eyes of God. So that means if I accept that, means I have rejected the value of the Bible. Okay, and the temptation is to think this way. Well, I know God, you know my heart, right? You know my belief. So I'm just going to continue to trust you, bow down to you. But, you know, in public, it's okay. You know, I'm just going to compromise. If I do that, I have bowed down to the gods of our culture. By the way, if you are homosexual, let me tell you, I love you. And this church will always have an open door for you. Okay, this church is a home for the imperfect. We will welcome you. We will preach the gospel to you. We will walk alongside you. But we will not, we will not support your homosexual activity. And yet at the same time, we want to live together with you and we want to introduce you to the gospel because we believe the gospel is the best way for you to live as a human. Okay, and so if that's you, welcome to Roxanne International. But here's my position though. I know where I stand on this, and that is on the Word of God. And I refuse to bow down to the gods of our culture. So when we start to think this way, see, our culture put tremendous pressure on us to worship different God, to privatize our faith, and just to worship the gods of our culture. So there got to be a temptation that we face everywhere. There got to be tension. Do you feel that tension in the way you live your everyday life? Are you resisting? Because if you're not, most likely then you have assimilated with the culture. And let's look at the second thing that happened in the story. Let's continue. The accusation. So remember what happened in Daniel chapter 1, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they started at the bottom of the ladder as an exile. But then they got promoted. They are a lot smarter than the others. And then at the end of Daniel 2, they are promoted to high position in the province of Babylon. And what happened is this, with their quick rise to uh, authority, people began to be jealous. People began to, what? Who are these Jew exile? Why, why, why are they holding this position? People do not like them, okay? If you're students, you know this. How many of you do not like the smarty pan in your class? Raise your hand. I cannot raise my hand because I am that smarty pan in my class, right? But we don't like them, right? Because they, they kind of destroy the curve. And that's what happened. See, it's the drug Meshach and Benego there elevated quickly to the high position and people just began to be jealous about it. People do not like them. So what happened, they began to uh, create this scheme and they went to Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know, king, oh, great. King. And they're very smart about it. King, an awesome and mighty king you are. There's no king like you. So they praised Nebuchadnezzar and they're like, yeah, thank you. Awesome. I'm someone known. Great. Thank you. What happened? But here's what they say next. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This man, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, what happened is this. These people put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego against King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, you know, well, well it is true that SMA refused to bow down and worship the gods of Babylon, but SMA does that because because they value their faith. Not because they ignore Nebuchadnezzar. Not because they don't pay attention to Nebuchadnezzar. And yet now these people try to pit SMA against Nebuchadnezzar. So it becomes very personal. So now Nebuchadnezzar is extremely furious. He's angry, okay? Which led us to the third chapter. The stand. So the king summoned SMA. And he asks, well, SMA. Is it true that I hear that you refuse to bow down to the image that I created? Here's what I'm going to do. I like you guys. Okay, You guys are brilliant. You guys are wise. I need you in my kingdom. So I'm going to give you another chance. Okay, When you hear the music, bow down and worship the statue. That's it, man. All you have to do is just bow down and worship the statue and don't worry about what you did in the past. 
But if you don't, I'm going to throw you into a burning, fiery furnace. So that's a threat. And this is what he said in verse 15. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? See, now Nebuchadnezzar began to play God. He forgot that just a chapter earlier that he had a dream that there is a sovereign king, that there's an everlasting kingdom, that there's a God who gave Nebuchadnezzar all his power. He forgot all about that. And now he's thinking, there's no God that can save you from my hand. <laughs> so now the stakes rise. So this is not just a confrontation against SME. This is a confrontation against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I want to hit the pause button here because you know what's coming. If you grew up in Sunday school, you know what's coming. Okay, you, you know it. But I don't want you to answer too quickly, okay? But here's the question that I want you to wrestle with. What would you do if you were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I think you know the right answer. Well, you know the right answer. But let me tell you why they have many other reasons to do different things. Okay? I can think of three reasons why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could compromise. Three, rational, three reasons. First, rational reason. Well, they can compromise for the sake of the other Jew in the exile. Okay? If they refuse to bow down, what happens is this. It's not going to just lead to their death, but Nebuchadnezzar might be angry and annihilate all the Jews in the kingdom. So that's not good, right? But if they remain in their position, they can do so much good for the rest of the exiles. So if they just have that power, they can do so much good. So basically, they, all they need to do is bow down for a greater purpose. It's rational, right? That's the first reason. The second reason is a wise reason. Nebuchadnezzar really liked them. If not, why will, they, why will he give them a second chance? He really liked them. And so probably the wise thing to do is basically, right now he's angry, just appease his anger. Just bow down and worship the statue once and then come back to him again when he's in a better mood and talk to him out of it. It might work. Sounds like wisdom, right? Or three is the theological reason. Basically, they know that every other God is no God. That's clear in the Bible that every other idols are nothing. There's only one true living God. So they can basically say, well, if that's true, if I bow down to that statue, basically it means nothing because there's no God except for Yahweh. So this is what happened. I can bow down on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. Well, God look at my heart anyway. God look at the heart. So it doesn't matter if I bow down. Sounds like a good theological reason, right? But they do not knew, do any of the above. Okay? They choose none of the above. And this is the heartbeat of the passage. This is what they do. It's beautiful. Verse 16 to verse 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What an answer. There are two parts to the answer, okay? And I need you to get this. There are two parts to the answer. The first is this. They are confident of God's power to save. This is what they say. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So they know that God is able. Or they know that their God is powerful. They know that their God is sovereign. They know that God has set them free from the Egypt. They know that God has split the Red Sea into two for them to walk in dry ground. They know that God has given them the land of Canaan miraculously with all God's power for them. In fact, God has given them the dream and the interpretation in a few chapters earlier. So they know what their God can do. So they have confidence, full confidence. Listen, King Nebu, my God is able to save us. Our God is able. Not only our God is able and powerful, but our God will do it. I mean, did you see that? Their God say, our God will do it. 
What a confidence in God's power to save. But it does not stop there. The second thing that they say is they trust God's sovereign purposes. Here's what I say. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But if not, these three words are the very definition of what faith is. Okay? See, they have full confidence in God's power to save. Oh, they have no doubt. And they have full confidence in God's willingness to save. Full confidence. Yet at the same time, they say, but if not, they will still trust Yahweh. They will still trust God. And they will not bow their knee. With another word, their faith is on who God is first and foremost, and not on what God can do for them. They love God for God. For them, obedience to God is more important than deliverance from God. I mean, do you get that in, the, in this passage? This is beautiful. Okay, let me put it this way. Through faith, trust in who God is and not simply in what God can do. Through faith, trust in who God is and not simply in what God can do. And this is extremely relevant for us. So we live day and age where there were many people, there are many people who left behind their Christian faith because they're disappointed at God, because God did not give them what they expected. So they, they believe in this kind, some kind of form of prosperity gospel where if you just have enough faith, if you just trust God, then God will give you what you desire. God will make you healthy. God will make you wealthy. So if you just have, be good, then good things will happen to you. Their understanding of Christian faith is not one based on the Bible. So they believe, I mean, I mean they believe in suffering. So they believe, yeah, yeah, suffering might come. But when suffering comes, just know that God is preparing you to be the next prime minister of Egypt. And let me tell you, that's not right. That is not the faith that we see in the Bible. Because Christian faith, get this, Christian faith is a but if not faith. See, Christian faith believes that God is able. But Christian faith also believes that God a lot of time works in different way than what we expected. That God's way is not our way. Well, sometimes God miraculously show off His extremely supernatural power and rescue us and heal us. Yes, He does. But sometimes, sometimes He lifts us on our own and allow us to endure pain, suffering, tribulation. But then we still trust Him. So if God deliver us from our pain, praise Him. But if God leave us to our dead, praise Him. That's what a Christian faith is. See, I, I see this truth play out in my own life, okay? Um, if you do not know, um, many years ago, I was diagnosed with leukemia. And the doctor, my doctor, was not sure if I'm going to make it or not. Because apparently, my leukemia was a um, little type that if I were just a month late, I'll be gone already. So when we press the question to him, you know, whether chemotherapy will make me better or not, he refused to answer. Because, you know, as a good doctor, uh, he's not supposed to give a false hope to his patient. All he did say was, you know, we're going to try our best. That's it. So at the time, uh, you know, the perk of being a pastor kid, I have so many people pray for me. My parents asked all different pastors from all different countries to pray for me and... Uh, and that's great. Uh, thank you if you pray for me at the time. Thank you. Like, I remember still my dad um, anointed my head and my feet with oil, right? Charismatic. Here's what happened. Make a long story short, 11 years later, I'm still here. And I've been declared medically clean from leukemia for the past six years. And now I'm one of your pastors. Praise God. Here's what happened though. Who healed me? Is it chemotherapy? I don't think so. I believe with all of my heart, it is God who healed me. God might have used chemotherapy. Of course he could, and possibly he did. But at, at the end of the day, it is God who healed me. So do I believe that God can heal? Yes. Do I believe that God will to heal? Yes. But do I believe that God always heal? No. 
This is what we need to understand, though, because this is the struggle that I have. Okay, because of my miraculous healing from leukemia, what happened is this. Uh, people hear about it, and people begin to ask me to pray for different people who had leukemia. So they, they asked me to pray, and I did. Okay? So I prayed for four different people. I think that I can remember of four different people who had the same leukemia as I am. And let me, I'm, let me tell you, I have 100% record. I'm proud to tell you I have 100% record. All four people that I pray for all went to be with Jesus. <laughs> That's my record, 100% record. So apparently when I pray for people, they do not get healed. But I get healed. Like who am I to tell people that God did not heal? Because I get healed. But I sometimes I also can't tell people that you will always be healed if you have enough faith because that is not the reality. And this is why I, was, I, very, I hesitated for a long time Every time people invited me to tell story, to preach about my struggle with leukemia. Because what they want to hear is the fact that God is able, that God can save, that God is powerful, and that's yes and amen. But Christian faith also speaks the other side of the coin, which is God is sovereign. He has purposes. He works in different ways than what we expected. But if not faith, He's able and yet at the same time, his purpose is not our purpose. See, can faith lead to disappointment? Definitely. But if you walk away from Christian faith because God did not give you what you want, then probably you never trusted God in the first place. Let's continue with the story then. The fourth chapter, the fiery furnace. So Nebuchadnezzar is not happy with this answer. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar is not happy. Nebuchadnezzar expects SMA to, all right, well, you know, I'm going to bow down because they, they're afraid of the fiery furnace. But yet SMA said, no, 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 no. We're not going to bow down. We trust that our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're going to still worship our God. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar was furious. So he hit up the fiery furnace but seven times. And then he threw SMA into the fiery furnace. And then even the, the fire was so hot until the soldiers who threw them into the fire were killed. So now what happened to Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then? Verse 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselor, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fort is like the son of the gods. So Nebuchadnezzar is shocked at what he sees. So he did the math, all right? One, two, three. Wait a minute. Four people? Who is that fourth person? Wait, I thought we just threw three. And why are they walking in the fire furnace? Why are not they burned to death? What happened to them? Okay. So now, because Nebuchadnezzar is curious, what happened? Do we not throw three people? Yeah, we throw three people. Why? There's four. So, uh, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to walk out of the fiery furnace. And he's absolutely shocked by what he sees. Verse 27. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselor gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not sink, their cloaks were not hum, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Do you see what happened? It's as if they were not even in the fire. See, God is just showing off right now. Remember Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, challenged God? There's no God that can save you from my hand. He's, and here's the God of the heaven. He's probably laughing in the heaven. Like, really? You're going to challenge me that way? Let me show you. Bam! They're throwing the fiery furnace and they walk out as if they're not even in the fire at all. Not even a hint of the fire was found in them. And that is the God that we serve. But don't miss the point, though. Here's the crucial point that I need you to get. See, God did not save SMA from the furnace. God saved SMA in the furnace. I mean, God could have, I mean, God could just send a lightning from heaven, boom, and destroy that fiery furnace and set SMA free from the furnace. God could have to do that. Or God could probably rip up, you know, tear off the roof and show it, grab him out of, with his mighty hand out of the very furnace. God could do that, but he doesn't. Yet, 
the God who did not save them from the furnace is with them in the furnace. Oh, I don't want you to miss this. That's the way a lot of time, my friend, God works in our life. See, every time I read this story, I cannot but be reminded of the first that my dad gave me just right before I have to go through chemotherapy. Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2. But now, that says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Oh, my friends, notice what God says through Isaiah. God did not say, you will not walk through fire. You will not walk through water. No, but God said, when you walk through the fire, when you walk through the river, when you walk through the water, I am with you. And that is the promise of God for us today. So what's the implication of the story for us then? His implication for us. Suffering is inevitable. Living as sojourners and exile will require you to take the stand and it will be painful. You cannot avoid suffering. If you avoid suffering, what happens is you assimilate with the culture. You bow down to the guys of our culture. But the promise of God is this. If you trust God, He does not say you will not go to the furnace, but He says He is with you in the furnace. And how beautiful is that? And that's what God shows us today to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what happened? There is the fourth person in the fire. Okay? There's a song that we sing earlier. There is another in the fire. And who is this another in the fire? And I'm convinced this is the pre-incarnate Jesus who showed up in the Old Testament. Why did Jesus show up out of nowhere? Is it because Jesus was bored? I got, I'm bored, I'm going to visit Sadrach, Meshach, and Meshach. No, no, no. Because there's a reason why he showed up in the fiery furnace. Because this story, my friend, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is not first and foremost about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This story points us exactly to what Jesus will have to go through for you and me. Just think about it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Jesus is overt to bow down to the gods of the culture. The devil asks Jesus, all you have to do, Jesus, just bow down to me, worship me, and you don't have to go to the cross. You can avoid all pain and suffering. I will give you what you want. Just bow down to me. I will give you the kingdoms of this world. And then Jesus said, no, I, will ref- I refuse to bow down. It is written that you shall worship the Lord your God alone. And Jesus refused to bow down. And just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, Jesus has to take the stand. Jesus understands the meaning of but if not faith. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to God, I know, Father, Father, if you are willing, you can take this cup away from me. The day before crucifixion. So in other words, Jesus said this, My God, Father, I know that you are able. I know that you are powerful. I know that you can do all things. I know that you can take away this cup of wrath from me. You are able to do it a different way. I know you are. But then this is what Jesus said. Yet not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus said, I know you're able, God. I know what you can do. Yet at the same time, I trust your sovereign purpose. I know that your way, not my way. You work in nature's way, and I choose to trust you. And because of this, because of a bad, if not faith, Jesus entered into the ultimate fiery furnace. And at the cross, at the cross, Jesus enters into God's wrath. Jesus took the punishment of sin for us. But this is the difference though. Unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when Jesus entered the ultimate furnace, God was not with Jesus. That's why Jesus cried at the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because at that time, God was not with Jesus because Jesus became sin for us. Jesus took the punishment of sin. He endured the full wrath of God towards sin. So that when you and I put your faith in Him today, here's the promise. Jesus is 
with you in your furnace. God abandoned Jesus in the ultimate furnace so that Jesus may be with us in our furnace today. And that is the gospel, my friend. See, we are not Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. This story points us to the one who fulfilled the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus went to God's ultimate furnace for us so that today, even though you and I are not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are better than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because we are covered in Jesus' righteousness. We are covered in Jesus' perfection. And Jesus is with us in our furnace. So how can we face our fiery furnace today? Here's the simple answer. You got to see Jesus went to the ultimate furnace for you and me. I love the way Keller put it. If you know Christ is thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, you will sense his presence in your smaller furnace. Furnace only makes you better. Jesus suffered, not that you might not suffer, but that when you suffer, you become like him. See, one of the questions that we often ask in our suffering is this, why? This is not fair, God. Why did you allow this to happen to me? And I do not know why, my friend. But here's what I know. We may not know exactly why God allowed us to go through suffering, but we know for sure that it is not because he does not love us. Jesus went through God's fiery furnace for us so that he can be with us in our furnace today. Let me close with this. At the end of the story, uh, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that the God of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the God above all God. See, but yet at this time, Nebuchadnezzar has yet to become a believer. It will come in the next chapter. Nebuchadnezzar has to sink so much lower before he's converted as a Christian. But yet there's a progress. Do you see what happened? In chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar slowly but surely becoming more and more aware of the God of the Bible. Here's my point. Your suffering is not just about you. Your suffering is a display of the beauty of the gospel. My friend, people are watching how you deal with your suffering today. People are watching how you live your life. And let me tell you, when they see your faith acted out, their faith is growing. So my friend, do not be afraid to take stand for what is right. Listen to Jesus' word, and I'm finished with this. John 16, verse 33. I've said this thing to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have many fiery furnace, and you will enter many fiery furnace. But when you walk into fiery furnace, Jesus is already there waiting for you. The king is in the furnace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story that you preserve for us. We thank you for the great, great faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego exemplified for us, Lord. And I just pray that as we look to you, Jesus, as we understand that you have entered into the ultimate fiery furnace for us, I pray that it enables us to know that we are not alone in our furnace today. Whatever kind of suffering that we have to go through, whatever kind of persecution that we have to go through because of our faith in you, I pray that we are reminded, Lord, that you are with us. And not only that, that our people around us are watching and that whatever we do, Lord, will bring glory to your name and people will come to know you because of that. Help us, Lord, to be able to live as sojourners and exile, to be faithful to your word. And yet when we have to disobey authority because of our faith in you, I pray that you give us courage, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. And God, every time we forgot the gospel, remind us of the beauty of the gospel, that the ultimate king, the sovereign king, has 
went through the ultimate furnace for us so that we are not alone in our furnace today. And we ask this in the name of beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.